You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. This is Present Tense, Future Perfect with your host, Marion Estienne. How are organizations, societies, and individuals being impacted by changes in our world? How do we develop leaders to respond to them? And what changes can we make today to have an impact on tomorrow? To help facilitate these and other questions, please welcome the host of Present Tense, Future Perfect, Marion Estienne. Hello, welcome to our show. This is Present Tense, Future Perfect. Your host is myself, Marion Estien, and this is the Bold and Brave Media Global Network TuneIn Radio. I will be hosting this show for the next 16 weeks and have asked a number of guests to join me, who I hope will inspire, provoke, as well as educate. So what is Present Tense, Future Perfect? No, this show is not about a language lesson or a blog about the benefits of speaking more than English in this era of the globalized economy. This is about leadership and not any kind of leadership, but a leadership that inspires us to go forward in what is called today a VUCA world. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term VUCA, it's a term coined by the U.S. military some time ago, and it means volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So these are the challenges that leaders face today and we face today. So what this show is about is looking at how we can make changes today so that they will have an impact on tomorrow. And this is as true as on a personal level as it is on an organizational or a social level. So what are these factors reshaping our world? We're at a turning point in history. Originally, somebody had asked me the question, well, what do you see as the challenges to organizations today? And I said, globalization and innovation. And then I heard Thomas Friedman speak about his new book, Thank You for Being Late. And in it, he added, in the, in the talk, he added two more. He said, well, climate change and technology. Well, I thought I could go along with that. And in fact, you might say, well, technology is the major driver of them all. The other thing that makes our VUCA world so challenging is that all these factors are interrelated, they're interconnected, and the speed of change is amazing. It's more than we can keep up with on a day-to-day basis. So over the next 16 weeks, I I, I intend to explore with experts in their fields these topics. For example, if we look at globalization. What, what's its effect on our economy and our labor market or economies and labor markets and how are international and global companies responding? If we look at innovation, we see that it's very exciting for companies to engage in new research to keep up with the demands of their customers. But it challenges them because it requires a dual focus on maintaining the current business while planning for the new. Now, climate change. Climate change, questions there about our agricultural requirements. What does it mean 
for us to feed ourselves and the rest of the world. And rising sea levels. Does this mean massive population shifts within and among continents? And what about animals? It affects them as well. And finally, with technology, if Moore's Law tells us that advances in digital technologies will grow exponentially every two years, what does it mean for our ability as human beings to maintain some sort of control over the machines and devices? Now, one of my show's guests, who for right now will remain nameless, made a very interesting and astute observation. Perhaps we and organizations expect too much of our leaders. So with that in mind, I've invited some guests to talk about mindfulness, stress management, the introduction of yoga into the workplace, and meditation. If the world is moving at such an incredible pace, and our ability to learn how to catch up with the factors responsible for change is challenged, then how do we anchor ourselves and keep in touch with our humanity, our souls, our feelings? So personal development and growth and fast learning may be our competitive advantage, but it would cost. So each of our guests will tackle a theme and bring their knowledge and insights to it. And as the show progresses, we invite you, our listeners, to participate. Eventually, phone in with questions and comments, or you may write me at marion at 360global.com or consult my website, www.360global.com. And 360 Global is spelled three. 60 Global, the number three, and 60 Global is a lowercase, all one word. And Marion is M-A-R-I-O-N. Think of Maid Marion, Robin Hood's other half. Think of Maid Marion in The Music Man or The Librarian. So, yeah, you're invited to participate in this. So we're on a journey together. And let's see if we can find some answers to our personal dilemmas as well as our organizational dilemmas in a fast-changing world. We need to understand what's pushing change in our lives before we can devise solutions on how to deal with it. So join me as we explore what's happening in the present so that we can design a more perfect future. Well, I'm going to begin to introduce my first guest. His name is David Magellan Horth. He's the Director of Innovation, Venturing, and Partnerships at the Center for Creative Leadership in Greensboro, North Carolina. Now, David's background makes him perfect for our first guest. He is a designer, a facilitator, and a coach who specializes in the confluence of design, innovation, and leadership development. So our show this week is going to focus on the dilemma of what David calls polarities. That is, how do businesses keep the day-to-day operations going, which make them money and employ people, while at the same time putting resources to innovation ideas? So David's background includes 21 years in the computer industry. He led the innovation, which won the Queen's Award for Technological Innovation in 1985. And his publications include an award-winning book, The Leader's Edge, Six Creative Competencies for Navigating Complex Challenges. David also has published rather extensively Uh, on blogs and at the center's own website on um, on what he calls RUPT. Now, I talked about VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, and he has another name for that, which he calls RUPT. So when David comes on, we're going to have him talk about that. Um, In addition... So I think to hear what David's alternative to VUCA is, 
Please stay tuned. This is Marion Estienne. This is Present Tense Future Perfect on the BBM Global Network Radio. And please stay tuned to meet David, my guest. Thank you very much. I look, don't touch that dial. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Life is a Renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real-life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Hello, I'm Steve Fagan, and I'm president and CEO of Fagan Associates, but I'm also a life coach. I'm here to help you reach your dreams, goals, and objectives. As a life coach, it's my job to be your support, to be your teammate, to help you understand what is your dream, what is your life passion, and then together we work as that team to help you reach your specific goals. Life is worth living the best you can be. Working with a life coach, you're fulfilling those dreams and goals is your passion, and it's your way of living. Let me help you do that today. Let me help you really reach the best that you can be as a person and live the life you should be living. I'm Steve Fagan. I'm a life coach, and I'm here for you. Contact Steve Fagan at FaganAndAssociatesInc.com or call 1-800-239-2701. And I'll be glad to help you move forward to live the life of success. Reach your dreams, your goals, your objectives. We can do it together. Ah, welcome back. This is Marion, STN. Present Tense, Future Perfect is the name of our show. We're on the BBM Global Network tune-in radio station. So may I, with great pleasure, introduce David Magellan Horth of the Center for, Horth of the Center for Creative Leadership. David, welcome to the program, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you so much. It's, it's great to be here. Um, I listened to your introduction with great uh, insights in there. I'm looking forward to spending some time with you and your listeners. Oh, well, thank you very much. I mean, um, before we get into the meat of what we're going to talk about, I think that you need to address the question. I said that you won a, an award, a Queen's Award for innovation. And I imagine mm-hmm. we have listeners shaking their heads saying, well, what was the Queen's Award? So do you want to explain something about your journey across the Atlantic? Sure. That, that, that Queen's Award for technological innovation was uh, an innovation that I had been, I wasn't the inventor of it. I just happened to understand how to navigate the organization to take a piece of technology that was uh, languishing in the, the research labs into something that uh, was available to the market. And, um, um, very, you know, I didn't personally receive the award. Uh, the people who did the actual work did, which is a good thing. Um, it's actually one of the things that led me to, uh, you know, my career now because uh, at the time I was working for a computer company and uh, they recognized that I had some kind of skills around helping innovation happen in the organization. And so they asked me to take on a role, which they didn't really give me the investment for. Uh, I'm trying to help the rest of the organization be innovative. And I realized that I'd stumbled into a, a career and um, uh, it's got, become almost full circle because I've recently been appointed Director of Innovation, Venturing and Partnership, which is something I wanted to do and obviously have skills and knowledge and background on over many years as an innovator. Now I'm being asked to help other people with innovation within mm-hmm. my own organization. So it's been a uh, it's been a productive, fruitful, exciting and awesome journey. Could you tell us or describe for us the, some of the focus of your work today? 
Um, my work today is mostly, you know, as of about uh, four weeks ago, is what I call divining. So uh, my focus is on, on helping people both within within the organization and external to the organizations um, for their ideas to, come, to go somewhere, to flow into the organization, to be picked up by others, to be transformed from ideas that have got maybe potential into actual innovations that add value in some way. Um, mostly, you know, the way we're looking at add value uh, is that they're they're useful to you know uh, our clients and our customers, but also in the process of actually making them useful, they generate revenue for our organisation, which helps mm-hmm. sustain the mission of our organisation. And no, continue, please. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say, uh, I still get, I still have some fun doing things like some design work. Uh, I'm, as a subject matter expert on innovation, I'm often asked to write things and to turn up at uh, um, uh, engagements with our clients as a, as a trainer. That's something I like to keep my eye on. It's a skill I've got, and I like to do that. Uh, but right now, uh, you know, for the first time in many years, I've, I'm leading other people. Uh, and uh, um, you know, helping set up processes and systems so other eyes, people's ideas can can have a chance to uh, to make it to to uh, innovations. Well, let's talk a bit about that because looking at your articles, um, you have some very specific ideas about how innovation can happen in companies. So, one of my questions is, what do you think? From, and, and then you're dealing with companies on a day-to-day basis. Who are your clients? Mm-hmm. Is what's driving innovation in companies today? Um, in the first part of your presentation, I think you nailed just about everything. It's the turbulence in the world which is causing people to look afresh at the, at the forces around them. And, you know, uh, you can be an exciting, you know, productive organization one moment and the next moment something's happened in the world uh, which is actually eating your eating your business away or a competitor an unexpected com- uh, competitors arrive but the turbulence that exists is what people are looking for how can we actually not just survive but thrive in an organization with such turbulence in it um, so it's one of the top we know in our own organization from the research we've done it is one of the top drivers uh, in organizations how do we actually sustain who we are as an organization in the long term, um, given all the forces around us. Well, I can see how this would be something very pressing on senior management or the board, you know, who are Mm -hmm. taking a more systems view of the company and the world markets, who are people that will think in the longer term. But how does this work out when you go up and down the organization, especially those people who are operational and who may be on the front lines and who have nothing to do with strategy or the future? Yeah, the, the, the first people that um, the, the first people I tend to address, you know, is obviously there's a, a large population of these people in the middle of the organisation who have pressures coming on them from all directions, from from the top of the organisation strategically downwards, from people who might be coming to them with ideas, um, coming up the organisation, uh, peers who they may or may not be networked with. So there's a real cauldron in the middle of an organization that I, as I sometimes say, can become the, the, the graveyard of innovation and uh, and ought to be the hotbed because the middle is also the place that, that tends to be best networked. It tends to be the place where things can really take off. Um, but, but there are, you know, there are pressures to be, to be dealt with, including, you know, strategy says we should be doing this. However, uh, mm-hmm. I've got a business to run. And uh, and I need to actually make certain that business successful. Um, how can I how can I do both? How can you expect me to both basically pay attention to today's business while uh, generating business for the future? Well, I know when we talked before, you talked about the polarities. This is the polarity that you mentioned. So, do you want to talk a bit about? Yeah, it's. Um, I, I got a, a, a word you will recognize immediately. I was at breakfast with. Uh, a colleague of mine this morning, and and uh, he was, you know, we were having a conversation about what does what does leadership look like into the in the in future organisations, and mm-hmm. top of his list was the ambidextrous leader. 
<laughs> and it's exactly and it's exactly this polarity. It's exactly this polarity. How do I how do I invest for the future and make certain that that uh, that we've got a business in the future and we're growing in the future while actually being successful and uh, you know. Uh, creating revenue, creating services and products for for our customers now uh, at the same time, and that that's the polarity. And and you know if, if you if we can actually change our thinking to thinking you can't do one, uh, you have to do one or the other. What you might call either or thinking mm, um, yes. into in, into what what you might call both and thinking. So it's about it's a it's about having your cake and eat it. Okay, David, hold on to that because we need to explore this. We're going to take a break now. This is Marion Estien. This is Present Tense, Future Perfect, and we're on the Bold and Brave Media Net- Global Network. Tune in. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Thank you. Patricia Fayweather Harlow is passionate about the environment and conserving our natural resources. She's written a five-part book series for all ages called Rock with Rodney and Party with Perky to Preserve Wildlife, which brings awareness through these vibrant characters on preserving and protecting our national parks and historic landmarks. Harlow has launched a campaign to mobilize green supporters, informing a united front against big oil, big coal, and the Keystone XL pipeline. And she addresses the controversial practice of fracking in books four and five. She's determined to bring greater awareness to the dangers of drilling and running crude oil through pipelines that cut through pristine landscapes. And she empowers readers to take action in keeping America beautiful. To learn more about Patricia Fayweather Harlow and to purchase her books, visit www.patricia-fayweather-harlow.com. That's F-A-Y-E-R-W-E-A-T-H-E-R. And play your part in preserving the landscape that we all share and love. Hi, my name is Myra Fox, and I am a survivor. I am the founder of the Castle Lewis I Survived Foundation and the author of a series of books entitled I Survived a Murder Untold, which tells the story of my sister and I who were abandoned and left in the care of a woman who beat us repeatedly. Unfortunately, it resulted in the death of my sister, Castle Lewis, which is revealed in a page-to-page chilling story. After spending time in the foster care system, I've documented my suffering and my loss and ultimately my survival. I'm blessed to work daily in my community and surrounding areas to give back by helping others and feeding the homeless. I want to spread awareness of the dangers of abuse. You can purchase my books and contribute to the Castle Lewis I Survive Foundation by visiting www.castlelewis.com or you can call us at 540-999-8401. Thank you. This is your host, Marion Estienne. You are listening to Present Tense, Future Perfect on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And we are talking to David Magellan-Horth, who is talking about innovation and about the graveyard of innovation or the hotbed, which can occur in the middle of any company. So, David, let's continue that discussion, um, because one of the things that keeps occurring to me, and I've seen this quite a bit in my own work, is that the culture of a particular organization will not allow something that is new, original, or different, that people mm-hmm. are very resistant to change. And as and because I do coaching as well, I, I deal with that on a day-to-day basis with clients about the resistance to change. As much as they want something new and different in the future, it's not guaranteed that that's going to happen. I don't know. Any comments on that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that is obviously it's uh, shifting the culture is like turning an oil tanker at sea, right? Mm. It takes several, mi- several miles. It doesn't turn on a dime. It's several miles before it actually changes direction. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's how it is with trying to shift the culture in some ways. So I think, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, that myself and others talk about is what are those things that, uh, you know, and, and small chunks, what are those small things we can do that will actually help people, leaders, who are at the end of the day, leaders help develop and set the culture of an organization. What can they do to actually deal with that idea that came out of the blue, um, 
remember I had a, telling some stories with, with you last time we spoke about what do you do when somebody comes to you with a new idea? And uh, one of the stories I tell is, uh, you know, when I did that with another organization, I asked that question of several people and one senior manager basically um, had a horrendous response to that and where he, he, let me just put it this way, he would prefer that the people who came up with ideas didn't exist anymore. Uh, <laughs> and when I went to an... Remember, I said it more horrendously than that. But then, um, then another person, when, it, when it, what do I do, what do you do when somebody comes to you with an idea? He said, "I tell them to take the afternoon off." And I asked him why. And you know, clearly in this, you know, this position of saying I've got to actually get on with strategic work, etc., uh, he, he responded, "I tell them to take the afternoon off." And I'm intrigued. I'm thinking this guy understands what you do with a new idea. And I asked him why, and he said in the hope that the idea goes away. And, you know, and there are, there are other responses and other things we can do and to shape even our own part of the organization. One of those is, to, uh, is how you respond to an idea in the first place. One of the things we will tend to do is we'll get into this language of yes, but, and everyone hears the but, yes. and, know yes. that, and, it, and it's crushing. You know, I, I talk about ideas... Um, Ideas, uh, you know, are fragile, and so are people, and so we, we have to, you know, we have to acknowledge that, and we have to acknowledge that innovation is a people process. That, that innovation is driven by passionate people, whatever level they are in an organisation. So, how do we actually cherish that passion and the ideas that go with them, and help shape those ideas? And I, I talk about one of those principles is about connecting ideas with ideas. Ideas with people and people with people. So that's one of the roles uh, that people in an organization, especially in the middle, can actually do to, to, to foster and drive forward an idea. The other one is using tools like, you know, being positive when you first hear an idea come to you. What do you like about it? Start from there. What do you like about the idea rather than what you don't like about the idea? And then moving into what else might the idea actually bring to us over and above what it seems to be on first glance, and then things like, then we start talking about, you know, what are the issues? And if we surface issues, then we should be talking about ideas that might actually help those ide help those issues be resolved. Um, so this is a whole host of things we can do when somebody comes to with us with a new idea, beyond being negative about it, and beyond saying, you've got no time for that idea, but saying, you know, how do I help you see this idea in a new light? How do I help you move it forward? How do I, do I connect your idea with somewhere else in the organization where it might be more relevant than it, than it is in my part of the organization? You know, well, I that, think that's... Gets, go on. No, I was just going to say, I think that that's part of um, human nature is to find, first of all, we know for a fact that we seek out information which reinforces our points of view in any event, that we don't go out looking for challenges to our ideas. We want confirmation of them and that we also right. very, feel very threatened by new ideas. And this sort of right. triggers off the fear or the flight or, or fight response in many ways. I mean, this is what neuroscience keeps telling us about. And, and, and you, you find the same thing very often with cultural differences as much as with functional differences in organizations or among teams in particular. You know, here's something different and I don't like it and I'm going to run away from it or I'm going to fight it. So, there is, you know, when we were talking before, you mentioned something about there's work to be done on an individual level as well as uh, a collective level. And then there's mm -hmm. the visible and the invisible. So, right. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I was, I was kind of giving you that two by two quadrant way of looking at it. So, you know, if you think about a two by two, um, you know, box in, in which, you know, the, the vertical axis is, um, uh, uh, individual at the top and collective at the bottom, and then from right to left, you've got the, the, the on the right you've got the visible, on the left you've got the invisible. And so when we're when we look, if you look at the bottom right hand corner of the box, it's basically when we've got the collect we've got the collective visible. That tends to be around systems and structures and so on. I mean, 
uh, my my da- my daytime job these days is actually very much in that area. How do I set up systems that can help innovation happen in in my own organization and other organizations? When we look at the the tangible. Uh, the, the tangible uh, individual level, it's, you know, it gets into the neuroscience front. There is science that tells us how, you know, people generate ideas and what, the, and what ideas are likely to go forward. There are things we can do uh, tangibly in, in providing individual people with tools and techniques that can help them, first of all, generate ideas and then move those ideas forward. Now I'll move to the uh, the invisible, and that gets into personality types, and some people are better at some aspects of innovation than others, and knowing what strengths we are, we have. You know, one of the things that's really, really important in that area is that diversity in a team is really important. Diversity is a really important ingredient for innovation. Diversity of every kind, personality kind, ethnic diversity, geographical diversity, mm-hmm. are all major contributors to successful innovation. And then finally, uh, the collective invisible is what we, we were talking about briefly before, the, cult, the culture of an organization and how you shift that to be a more innovative organization. Okay, we're going to finish this in a couple of minutes. And for now, we're taking a break. So hold on. David is going to finish his two-by-two matrix. And this is Marion Estienne. You're listening to Present Tense Future Perfect on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We're coming right back. Jenny Friend is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a certified clinical sexologist, commonly known as a sex therapist with over 30 years of experience in the field of sexuality. She's been a researcher and teacher and is further trained in human development over the lifespan. She's also a published author and a radio personality. Her specialized training in lifespan developments means she can help individuals, couples, and families through difficult developmental phases. Her primary ways of working are through the tools of cognitive, behavioral, and psychoenergetics theories and techniques. Couples, individual men and women, and families are also welcome. She can meet in her office in Costa Mesa, California, or on the Internet through Skype at Jenny Friend MFT. Call 714-210-9200. You can also send an email from her website at www.centerforclarity.org. That phone number again is 714-210-9200. Are you looking for employment and live in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is the place for you. Are you an employer looking to fill a position or quite a few positions in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is for you. Employers, JobsAnnex.com is your resource for career-minded people. JobsAnnex.com is the convenient place for job seekers and employers to hook up and move forward. Jobs Annex has been serving Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties for over 14 years. Jobs Annex is a former employment search firm. We've evaluated many thousands of resumes and we understand what employers want and what job applicants need to be successful in their interviews. At Jobs Annex, we provide you with the tools to tell your story for free. Our resources at JobsAnnex.com will help each applicant construct an award-winning resume, an eye-catching cover letter, and key interview questions to ask in various types of interviews. Best of all, it's free. JobsAnnex.com. That's J-O-B-S-A-N-N-E-X dot com. Well, welcome back. This is Marion STN, and this is, you are listening to Present Tense, Future Perfect, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We're speaking with David Magellan Horth of the Center for Creative Leadership on the subject of innovation and how you get it in an organization. David, when we left off, you were talking about a two-by-two matrix. Do you want to summarize for us about the rest of it? You talked about visible, invisible, collective, and individual. Right. And and so so just using a a couple of words with the – which goes around that matrix so that the the, the the collective tangible if you will visible is what i call is all about systems and, and how those work systems and processes and you know it gets into things like idea management systems and things like that but the uh, um the individual visible tends to be the things we can measure and touch and feel it tends to be around tools and techniques and then even getting into the science of uh, neuroscience of how ideas actually work or don't work and how we respond to them and how can we respond better. Um, 
the the the, uh, um, the, the invisible um, individual is around is around you know personality types and what you know what preferences we have, and how we can use our preferences with people who've got different preferences, and in a way that will help innovation move forward. And then finally, it's a, the, the last box was around collective invisible, which is that thing that people often like to talk about and get feared by. But how do you develop an organisation? that embraces, you know, whose culture and leadership culture mm. embraces innovation. Well, speaking <clears throat> of that, in your work, have you come across any organizations that have been s- successful in embracing that kind of work or innovation? Yeah, so, sometimes, sometimes unconsciously, I'm, I'm wondering. Um, it, th- there are, and obviously we've been working with organizations that are wrestling with it, are, uh, and, you know, are part of the way there. Uh, a lot of the organizations that, that are successful in this, it's embedded into who they are. It's, it's, it's how they became to be, to be innovative in the first place. I mean, the famous story of 3M is basically being sold a mine that, that, that wasn't productive, and so they had to be resourceful around it. You can go into the... You can go into the, you know, the technology companies. I mean, I've been talking to people from um, Electronic Arts recently, but even organizations mm-hmm. like that, which are amazingly successful in the, in the games business, have had to go through, you know, some pains to bring themselves, you know, to transform themselves to, for the modern day and the, and the modern game player and so on. Google's always a favorite to bring up. Yeah, one of my, yeah. one of the... One of the ones that surprises people when I mention them, um, I haven't been with them for a few, for a few years, but one of the organizations I explored um, some years ago was the IRS, our own IRS. And I found them to be uh, a highly innovative organization. And, and again, it was caused by uh, a necessity that happened in 1985 when um, people were not getting their, their, their refund checks because they had a systems crash. Uh, a computer systems crash, and it led them to have a good look at themselves, to transform themselves, and to transform themselves in terms of uh, innovation. And it's, it was uh, one of the events, if you will, that led to uh, the IRS having being able to file your taxes online. And it started at around the that era. So you'll be surprised where you'll find innovation, and you'll be surprised about organizations that are seen as innovative today have often had to go through a cycle either at the beginning of their life cycle or sometime in the middle where things, where they got complacent. You know, I made, my own organization is a highly innovative organization, but, you know, it too has to examine itself and say, okay, this made us successful. Now, now what do we need to look, look for into the future? We always have to be looking at the, you know, horizons way ahead of us that we can't even imagine. Uh, even if we're successful, who knows what... Uh, who's Google, who uh, Google's competition will be in the future? Or in come the future, from somewhere yeah. And expect, yeah, yeah. Well, what you know, what does that say though for older industries in this country, in manufacturing, or in uh, resource production, the oil industry, the coal industry, the car uh, industry? What does that say yeah, about them? I, I think it's a. I, I think it's uh, you know it's all about. In, in this sense, you know, it's a far too overused word. The notion of transformation. About, um, but I'm thinking back to my old marketing days. Um, I'm trying to remember the the famous paper. It was called Marketing Myopia. I just remembered it, in which you know organisations see themselves in one way, and are unable to transform who they are into you know into a contemporary setting. You know. Um, I heard a story this morning about Nestle, uh, who was an organization that thought of themselves as being in the food business. Yes, right? yes. In, so, in some ways. And now they're, they're transforming themselves and say, in, into thinking of themselves as a health and welfare organization. You know, it's, there are things that we need to do to be taken to step back and look at who we are, not only now, but obviously into the future that might actually transform who that we're no, we're no longer a manufacturing company. There's another competence we've got, which actually led to manufacturing, but we've now got to think of ourselves in another way. Um, I remember I worked, worked for a computer company for 21 years, and we thought of ourselves as a computer company, and then 
suddenly we were calling ourselves an information technology company. Mm. And when I left, just before I left that organization, it began to see itself as an integration company. In other words, in it, which is really challenging, it's like we don't just produce, we don't just bash tin, as we used to call it. We produce solutions. And by the way, the software and the hardware and so on may not be something that we made ourselves. It might be that we actually have to integrate and use other vendors. But what our expertise is bringing things together. So those are the sort of things that people have to pay attention to. They have to reframe who they are and be prepared obviously to partner with other organizations. Uh, before we talk a bit more about that, I'd like to go back to something that I said in the beginning about a VUCA, a VUCA world. Um, and when we come back from the break, I'd like you to talk about RUPT, which is your acronym mm-hmm. for a, what we now call a VUCA world. All right. Mm-hmm. Stay tuned. Listen to David go further with his thoughts. And this is Marion Estienne. You're listening to Present Tense, Future Perfect on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We'll be right back. Are you stressed? Is your stress driving you crazy? Do you know there are many ways to relieve this stress? The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic does just that. Reduce your stress plus so much more. Established in 1997, the Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic offers an approach to wellness for those individuals who choose to either utilize appropriate complementary methods to enhance their current medical care or to those individuals who are on their personal journey toward improved health and wellness through the use of therapeutic bodywork, Reiki energy healing, or hypnosis. The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic is owned by Dr. Judy Dean, a registered nurse and board-certified massage therapist and medical hypnotherapist in LaPorte, Indiana. Visit www.spiritwithinmassage-hypnosis.com to see all services offered by Dr. Judy. For a free personal consultation, please call Dr. Judy Dean at 219-326-1380. The Spirit Within Massage and Hypnosis Clinic, 219-326-1380. Escape from Hell, A Woman's Story is a passionate book that tells the true story of author Rhonda Knutson's journey through the darkness and adversity of abuse. The book takes readers on an emotional trail from the depths of despair to the heights of forgiveness and understanding. She was inspired to help others, and her book is a vital tool through this process. Faithful to God and devotional to her beacon of hope, Rhonda Knutson is a perfect example of finding a guiding light that helped her come through the dark and into the light. Her book can assist you in overcoming your challenges with abuse. The publication of Escape from Hell, A Woman's Story, is a triumphant achievement, and it can help you take ownership of your own experience of abuse and come through stronger than before. Rhonda is currently working on two more books, Shadows of Corruption and Coast to Coast on a Piece of Toast. To read more about this inspiring author and purchase her books, visit RhondaKnutson.com or go to www.amazon.com. We're back. Okay, this is your host, Marion Estienne. You're listening to Present Tense, Future Perfect on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio with our guest, David Magellan Horth, who's now going to talk about RUPT. David. <laughs> What does your acronym stand yeah. for? It stands for rapid. It can, uh, the U can be unclear or uncertain or both. Um, the P stands for paradoxical and the T stands for tangled. And, and uh, the, the reason I came up with this in the first place was um, I was working with organizations both in this country and particularly in Europe who were uncomfortable with... Uh, with the VUCA term because of its origins, uh-huh. um, but it was all. Uh, and you know, you, you mentioned it earlier; it has a military origin. It, it was. Does, uh, it does. It was a. It was a throwaway line by you know military officer at probably one of their colleges. Um, but the reason I came up with it was actually not just that; it was also it was e- easier to connect. Um, the, the concept of rupt with what you can do about it in terms of leadership leadership development and leadership actions uh, and so it became you know if you read one of my blogs on that you will have seen that that I talked about some of the competencies that you can tap to make sense of uh, while you're in the midst of turbulence to make sense of and, and uh, move forward through it 
You know, so rapid stat is obvious. Uncl- you know, you never know when it's going to hit you. Uh, things have been happening in the world in recent, you know, in recent years um, have really kind of surprised us. And the paradoxical is really going to that thing that I talked about before. It's this ambidextrous leader stuff. It's this ambiguity. This is the polarities we have to wrestle with. And and then the tangle is that everything is connected to everything else. You can't yes, you can't yeah, move one piece without having yes. an impact on us, right? You know, it, so, it makes me think I've got a guest coming on who's from um, the Sloan School of Management. And it would be very interesting mm-hmm. to see how he would talk about people that are, whether they're senior executives or whether they're young people in MBA programs. You know, are, are business schools preparing people for rupture as opposed right. to the predictable business? Right. Yeah. Well, you 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 have a metaphor for rupt, uh, a story about yeah. rowing a kayak. Yeah. Do you want to tell us that story? Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a story that became part of my work with uh, my colleague and myself. Chuck Powers wrote a book called um, The Leader's Edge, <clears throat> and um, we've done a fair amount of research on it. And he said to me one one day, "We need to actually." Uh, we need to, you know, bond so that we can actually write effectively <laughs> together. So that we went up the mountains, and he's a, a whitewater kayaker from years, you know, from since he was a, a kid. So we went up the mountains of uh, of North Carolina, and uh, over a weekend we kayaked down down the river, the Nanahala. And, um, and and he taught me lots of things about it. I was actually equipped in the the front of the of the kayak, a twin kayak with a canoe paddle. He didn't trust me one which had two blades on it. And he was in the back with a, a classic p- kayak paddle. And the, the back of the boat is the, is the place to be. But one of the metaphor, lots of metaphors came out of this about turbulence and white water and, and so on. And one of those mm-hmm. was, of course, the notion that, um, you know, you have to pay attention to what's going on around you. And uh, the metaphor of that comes out of this is a whole notion of reading the water in every moment. You have to be able to read the turbulence and, and, and take actions based on what you see now as opposed to guessing what you see. You know, I, I say to people, uh, if, if you're a whitewater kayaker and you tell people behind you, do exactly as I do, they'll kill themselves. And the reason is the water's shifting at every moment. And so you, you have to learn how to read that water in every moment. You know, I, I, one of the things that happened to Chuck and I, you, you, I know you like this story, was um, we got a little tired and so we actually avoided going through the actual white water. We, did, we kind of sneaked past it um, and one of the dangers of that is there's an eddy and it turns us around and we were facing backwards. Um, facing backwards. We were going backwards down the next rapid. So I'm, so I'm now facing backwards and I'm in lead because the person at the back is the person who's steering. So I'm facing backwards and I'm steering the, the, through the next rapid. That was, that was fun. That's <laughs> scary and fun. But we, it became a metaphor for Chuck and I when we're talking to each other. We're able to kind of refer to those times and build that into some of our writing because it's it's loaded with metaphors and and, and competencies and all those things that you can talk about when you're uh, you know leading an effect in a uh, leading effectively in turbulent times and you're in the rupt as I call it in the rupts <clears throat> yes which leads me to 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 a thought about the importance of collaboration among colleagues in the workplace. I mean, you talked about diversity in teams. I'm working now with a, an assessment called a trust in teams indicator, which actually comes from the UK. But from uh, the whole idea there is how you build trust. And of course, it's collaboration. How do you get collaboration? You have dialogue. And so mm-hmm. here we have organizations, for the most part, set up on the basis of competition and you're judged by your performance um there are such things as certain people are not allowed to express themselves in an organization so do we get back to the culture argument when we start talking that way yeah sure but we also there are things we can learn there are there are skills and so on we can learn and you 
briefly raise the whole notion of <clears throat> dialogue. I was uh, at my mm. wife's uh, annual conference last week, and um, one of the wonderful, wonderful speakers you've ever get a chance to hear at him, uh, his name is Oscar Eustace, and he's one of the producers of uh, the blockbuster Hamilton. Uh, and he was talking about, you know, dialogue in a very interesting way about how dialogue is something that is um, continually on the, you know, in in theatre. Theatre works because there are tensions, because there are different points of view, because people are fighting, as it were, in the in the in the theatre. And so his whole thing is about that the truth lies in the dialogue, and. and if you will, the truth and the trust lies in dialogue. The truth doesn't exist in you or me. It mm. exists in the, dial in the dialogue between us, in us collectively making sense of things together. I think I told you the story about um, when I was doing a presentation in South Africa some years ago, and they weren't going to pay me, because, I, and I was happy not to be paid for doing this, this gig. Um, but at the end of it, they gave me a present, and they asked me to open it, and they, the book... Uh, that they gave me in this present was a book called Le Hotla, spelled L E G O T L A, and and it's and it's all about dialogue, and that's something that's well understood in South Africa about how you make I, sense sense of things across divides. On that basis, David, I have to thank you for your participation. I really enjoy talking to you, and we're going to take a break now. Thank you, David. This is Marion Estien. We're listening to Present Tense, Future Perfect on the BBM Global Network, Tune In Radio. Tune back in for our conclusions. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is a non intrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Mm, welcome back. This is Marion Estienne, and you're listening to Present Tense Future Perfect on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I want to thank David very much for his provocative remarks there about innovation in companies. And before I conclude and leave you with some thoughts to think about, because when we talk about how people behave in organizations, that's you and that's me. So very often it comes down to the individual as well as the collective, as David calls it. How did I get involved in leadership? I studied political science. And when I was in graduate school, I read this great book by James McGregor Burns. It's quite old now. It's called, it was called The Presidents. And he tended to focus 
on all the presidents who took real leadership at crucial moments, at turning points in our nation, in the American nation's history. These were transformational leaders. In fact, James McGregor Burns coined the term long before management development people did about what it means to be transformational. Transform is think of the the, the, the worm that becomes a butterfly. It transforms itself from one thing to another. That's what change is about. So when we look at the challenges we're facing in the future, now you can call it a VUCA world. You could call it a rupt world. It is disruptive and it's moving very quickly. And if we're going to survive, we have got to become butterflies. And even further, the old the analogy that's been made how many times before of the butterfly flaps its wings in China and there's a storm off the coast of Maine. It's because we live in an interconnected world and we don't always like it. It's frightening. It's threatening sometimes. But this is it. And it's technology for the most part that's gotten us there. What do we do? Well, we find a way to anchor ourselves in this new world. But in terms of acting collectively, the solutions seem to be in the area of dialogue and conversation. And so I'm hoping in the future, we will explore dialogue and conversation and how that's going to take us into a more perfect future. This is Marion SDN. Thank you for listening. This is Present Tense Future Perfect on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Till next week. Goodbye. This has been Present Tense Future Perfect with your host, Marion SDN. Join us each week as we explore the many aspects of leadership, globalization, and more on Marion SDN's Present Tense Future Perfect. been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.